All right, let's take our hymn books. Turn to hymn number 299. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find in my trials here. 299. On verse 3, we'll sing that third part where it says that I lose not faith, sweet consolation. It says offered me, but really it's given me. Given me within thy holy word. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all Army 
a representative of the king, to show kindness to Jeremiah and spot him out, spy him out among the captives. This place called Ramah here was about six miles north of Jerusalem, and it would have been a rallying point for these captives that from there they would be taken into Babylon or sorted out those that were of the poor and the weak. Nebuchadnezzar had said, don't worry about them, leave them there in the land. But here in verses 2 through 4, then we see Nebuchadnezzar's word to Jeremiah. The captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said unto him, The Lord thy God hath pronounced this evil upon this place. So here he's recognizing what the people of Israel, the Jews, would not recognize that the hand of God was against them. Here Nebuchadnezzar is saying and recognizing that if it weren't even for the Lord thy God, we wouldn't be here. Now the Lord hath brought it. That's an amazing statement right there from a wicked ruler and done according as he hath said. Because ye have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed his voice, therefore this thing has come upon you. Perhaps he had heard Jeremiah pronouncing some of these prophecies against the people. But here's this Babylonian prince or captain of the guard that is making a declaration concerning God that not even the Jews were affected by or would consider. They, rather than take the blame for their own sin and condemnation, found reason to blame God. But here he says in verse 4, Now behold, I loose thee this day from the chains which were upon thine hand. That shows that Jeremiah had gotten mixed in with the rest because he had been free and now suddenly someone had gone and put him in chains to be carried away and the Lord used Nebuzaradan to free him. And he says to him, if it seemed good unto thee to come with me into Babylon, come. Such was the tenderness that the Lord had given to Nebuzaradan for Jeremiah that he said, you come to my land, I'll take care of you, basically. But if it seem ill unto thee to come with me into Babylon, forbear. Behold, all the land is before thee, whether it seemeth good and convenient for thee to go, thither go. So here we find the Lord being merciful to Jeremiah. A lot of people like to say it's because Jeremiah was faithful. No, it was God that was faithful to Jeremiah. And therefore this kindness was shown unto him. Verses 5 and 6, then we see where Jeremiah, the Lord directs him to stay. He says, now while he was not yet gone back, he said, Go back also to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon hath made governor over the cities of Judah, and dwell with him among the people, or go wheresoever it seemeth somewhat unto, or convenient unto thee to go. So the captain of the guard gave him victuals and a reward and let him go. That's an amazing thing, too. He didn't just turn him loose, but gave him food. And when it says a reward, it just simply means he gave him some money, some coins, with which he would be able then to live from that. Then went Jeremiah unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahikim, to Mizpah, and dwelt with him among the people that were left in the land. Gedaliah, you see here, was a governor appointed by the king of Babylon to serve as an administrator over the land in lieu of a king. But here we see how the Lord, again, uses these uh, wicked kings. These are barbarians. They had just come in and slaughtered the land, and yet you see them being kind unto Jeremiah, one of the lords. And in actuality, he received better treatment 
from the hands of Nebuzaradan than he had from his fellow Jews. I find that to be the case many times. It's the religious people that find the greatest offense against you and say the meanest things. If you go out there in the street, those that have never perhaps heard, and yet the Lord causes them to be kind unto you, I face that. You get some nasty emails and some nasty comments about the message you've been preaching from people listening to you, but then you go to your workplace or somewhere else and people are kind. They love you. Glad to see you today. They haven't got anything against you. And so we find even here with Jeremiah that uh, the Lord purposed that this uh, wicked king should be kind unto him and leave him there to dwell among the people that were left in the land. And that's where the Lord purposed that he should dwell. When you see there the people that were left in the land in verse 6, you have to refer back to verse 10. The ones that Nebuchadnezzar left in the land were the poor of the people which had nothing. And the land of Judah gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. Jeremiah was not above the people. But when the Lord purpose that he should go back and dwell, that's where he dwelt. He lived among them because the Lord had given him a love for them. He wasn't just preaching condemnation and judgment, but the Lord had given a love for them, and here was again the mercy of the Lord that while all others were being taken out of the land, here the Lord purposed that Jeremiah should remain among them to be an encouragement to them. I wonder how much we value the fact that the Lord has left a servant among the people of the land and that that servant would minister unto that people. There's no greater blessing, I believe, for a city or for a country than that the Lord would put one of his servants where people can hear of Christ and the gospel. But how few there are that value it. Every once in a while they might give some thought and consideration to it, but for the most part, they're just going about their life, never considering that the Lord has put a witness right there in their midst. And for me, when I read this, that Jeremiah should stay in the land and go back among these poor. That's who the Lord, Jesus Christ, came to save, the poor, and uh, laid down his life to save such. Now in verses 7 through 10, then we have here more about Gedaliah, this governor, that... Nebuchadnezzar appointed should remain in the land. And it says, Now when all the captains of the forces which were in the fields, even they and their men heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah the son of Ahiakim governor in the land, and had committed unto him men and women and children and the poor of the land of them that were not carried away captive to Babylon, then they came to Gedaliah to Mizpah, even Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and Johanan, and Jonathan, the sons of Korea, and Saria, the son of Tanhumeth, and the sons of Ephi, the Netophilite, and Jezaniah, the son of Machathite, they and their men. And Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, swear unto them and to their men, saying, Fear not to serve the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. Now, why was he saying that? Well, that's exactly what the Lord had said. He told the children of Israel if they bowed to what God had already purposed and surrendered themselves to the Babylonians, that all would be well. The Lord would watch over. And those that were carried away captive into Babylon even though they were carried away captive, yet they were treated well in Babylon. They served many of them in the government and in the jurisdiction of, the, of Nebuchadnezzar. That's just the way he did it. The example would be Daniel and his three friends when they went into the land. But those that resisted faced death, and many of them died. And so Gedaliah here is simply reminding these people that he would set up captains over them 
and that they would be for their protection and that they were not to use their military power in any way to try to go against the Chaldeans, but rather to serve as citizens in that land under their authority until God purposed otherwise. This parallels what we read in Romans chapter 13. Here was Paul, when one of the worst empires it was in power, the Romans, and yet what did Paul say there in Romans 13? To submit yourselves under the powers that be. For there, there is no power that is but what is ordained of God. And so here was Gedaliah when he said here, do not be afraid. There in verse 9, fear not to serve the Chaldeans that dwell in the land. He was reassuring these officers and the men that were with him that the wisest action was to be bowed to God's judgment. And I would say that's a message that I have to declare today. You can fuss all you want to about powers that be and talk about all these things that, and fuss about it, but you know what? Bow, because it's God that has put each one in that place. And uh, Scripture says we're to pray for those in authority, that we who are the Lord's might live peaceable lives. That's why we do it. We're not to take up arms. We're not to go at these the powers that be as if somehow we're rebels. No. Who put them there? God did. All right. Then they're God's servants. That's how they're referred to in Romans 13. Ministers of God. For the good of, of those that they rule over. And uh, that's exactly the message that was here. Do not be afraid to serve the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land. And serve the king of Babylon. And it shall be well with you. And not only that, but he says in verse 10, As for me, behold, I will dwell at Mizpah to serve the Chaldeans, which will come unto us. But ye gather ye wine and summer fruits and oil, and put them in your vessels and dwell in your cities that ye have taken. So that's it. Wherever, wherever there's some bad, there's good. Because here the land had been completely devastated, and uh, landowners taken away, and get a lie of the governor saying, Now go, go dwell the in those lands and go ahead and do the harvest. Gather the food and whatever you can gather is yours. This is how the Lord purposed that he should provide for the remnant that remained in the land. And that's exactly what Gedaliah told them to do as, as Jeremiah himself had already said to them to do. That uh, through the Babylonians and God's judgment, yet they were to seek to honor and glorify the Lord in whatever state you are, therewith to be content. That's really the message. And so verses 11 and 12, we see even as a result of this, that the Jews who escaped to other lands come back to Judah. Verse 11 says, Likewise, when all the Jews that were in Moab and among the Ammonites and in Edom and that were in all the countries heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant of Judah and that he had set over them Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan. Even all the Jews returned out of all places whither they were driven and came to the land of Judah to Gedaliah unto Mizpah and gathered wine and summer fruits very much. There again was the Lord. You have a picture of the Lord bringing back from where they had escaped, now to provide for them once again in the land, even though the times and seasons were difficult. There's a reminder, too, the Lord's always going to care for his own, whether it was these that were carried away into captivity or these that remained in the land. But now, in verses 13 and 14, this Gedaliah is told of a murder plot against him. Moreover, Jehanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were in the fields came to get Eliah to Mizpah and said unto him, Dost thou certainly know that Baalus, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, to slay thee? But get Eliah, the son of Ahikam, believed them not. Here we 
we see where the Lord had purposed that even though he'd raised up Gedaliah to serve his purpose in governing that land, yet now being lifted up in pride, when he heard of this murder plot against him, Gedaliah's like, no way, that's not, that's not happening. And so the Lord used his unbelief ultimately to take his life. It says, Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, believed them not. And uh, if you look back, even though the events of, of Jeremiah 41, as, you, as we're going to read it next time, show that it was true, everything that was foretold was, was true, even Jeremiah foretold it, yet here we see Gedaliah foolishly thinking himself to be able to protect himself and uh, his life, even though the Lord had already purposed that by his unbelief he would be killed and murdered. And we see that in verse 15 and 16. This is where he rejects an offer of protection. It says, Then Johanan, the son of Korea, spake to Gedaliah and Mizpah secretly, saying, Let me go, I pray thee, and I will slay Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and no man shall know it. Wherefore should he slay thee, that all the Jews which are gathered unto thee should be scattered, and the remnant in Judah perish? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, said unto Johanan, the son of Korea, Thou shalt not do this thing, for thou speakest falsely of Ishmael. Here's an example of how the Lord raises up one, puts one down, raise up another, puts one down. And how men in their pride, when they're lifted up into positions of power, in their pride they're lifted up and don't seek the Lord. Gedaliah here, in no way hearing this news ever, we read he sought the Lord, but rather determined his own end. And as we're going to read, as I said next time in chapter 41, that end would be ultimately his death the blindness when God causes a man to believe a lie do you ever do you believe or don't believe the truth the same is true of today when you preach condemnation outside of Christ people don't believe it they're like no I, I got it you know I, I got this handled really but ultimately when they reason that way it's because God has left them to their own demise and in the end they and condemn. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word, how precious it is to read, how enlightening when your spirit is pleased to open our hearts. And I pray that uh, what we've read would be brought home to our hearts, that if you have given us eyes to see, and uh, if we see your hand of mercy in every way, all that takes place because of who you are and how you've purposed to deliver such as we are, I pray that in all things we glory. So we commend the rest of this time to you and pray for your blessing. And it's in Christ's precious name I pray. Amen. All right, here let's turn to hymn number 224. The Lord does give us faith to believe, to know whom I have believed. Not what I have believed, but whom I have believed. And one other word change in this particular song as we sing it in the second verse there not that I know that this saving faith faith doesn't save, Christ does but we can sing it I know that this saving grace to me he did in part so let's sing it that way 224 I know not why God wondrous grace to me he hath made known nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own but I know whom I have believed and am persuaded I 
unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in Him. But I himself, but just know that where God has purposed that church to grow and be built in the world, there will be opposition and persecution. The Lord said, in the world you shall have tribulation, and therefore the need for a ready defense. What is the defense of the church which Christ building in this world. Here in Nehemiah chapter 4 in verse 16 we read and it came to pass from that time forth so you go back to verse 15 that we saw last time when the enemies heard that it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to naught that we returned all of us to the wall every one unto his work. So the Lord purpose that the enemies back off and that the work continued. So it came to pass from that time forth that half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the harbingers, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They which builded on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side, and so builded. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. This is Nehemiah speaking. And I said unto the nobles, and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall. 
one from another. Remember this wall going all the way around Jerusalem. They put together the gates and now they were finishing the building of the wall. But all separated out around that city. In what place, therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet? Resort ye thither unto us. Our God shall fight for us. So that meant if there was one part of the wall that was being attacked and they heard the trumpet sound, they were to rally to that place. So we labored in the work, and half of them held the spears from the rise in the morning till the stars appeared, which means late at night. Likewise, at the same time, said I unto the people, let every one with his servant lodge within Jerusalem, that in the night they may be a guard to us and labor on the day. In other words, nobody goes home. This was an all-hands-on-deck call for the finishing of this wall. So neither I, this is Nehemiah speaking, he wasn't just giving orders and then going off someplace. Again, Nehemiah, picture of Christ with his people. Where are they most at peace? Where are they most at rest with his presence when he's with them? So neither I nor my brethren, that's who the Lord is pleased to call, those that he has come to redeem, his brethren. He's the son of God, and yet he calls sinners. He's redeemed his brethren, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard which followed me. None of us put off our clothes, saving that everyone put them off for washing. So here we have the picture of the wall going up and being completed. Some may ask, well, if... The Lord Jesus Christ has already won the victory for his church. Why is there even need to fight? Well, God has purposed in his sovereign grace that the world redeemed, I mean the church redeemed in the world, nonetheless should face great opposition and trouble in the world. All of this to manifest God's power in keeping his own. If you look over in John chapter 17, so when there's trouble afoot from our acquaintances and family members and others that attack us over this very gospel of Christ and his glory, what is our answer? Well, here in John chapter 17 and verse 15, our Lord said, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world. So just know, even if Christ has redeemed you at the cross and called you by his grace, yet you're still in the world. Have you ever wondered why it is he doesn't, from the time he converts you, now just take you out of the world? Well, there's a purpose that the Lord has for each of his own to remain in the world, but... The purpose is that we might see God's power and glory in keeping us in this world. Because he says here that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. Not just the evil one, but through anything that the world and all its evil can throw against any of the Lord's, that he would keep them. And that's certainly what we're seeing here in Nehemiah chapter 4. You talk about attacks and the enemy seeking to keep this wall from being built. Again, the wall being a picture of, of the church. Yet none of them could impede and ultimately keep this work from being done. And that, so that's where we see where God has purposed to keep his own in the world, but at the same time has equipped his church with a ready defense. You say, well, what's our defense? Here we see them speaking of a sword and a trowel and spears and, and tools for building. But what is our defense? As we live in this world, well, it's none other than Christ himself. If you look over in Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 through 12, it says, finally, my brethren... Paul writing to the Ephesians, writing to those that were facing persecution. 
Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against what? The wiles of the devil. What was it that was motivating these enemies even against Nehemiah and those that were rebuilding the wall? It was the very spirit of Antichrist. Because that, that temple that was being rebuilt, that wall represented the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he would come and accomplish many hundreds of years later at this point. But it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness in high places. Just know that wherever there is opposition against any one of the lords, for Christ's sake, there is behind that the very power of evil and Satan, spiritual wickedness in high places. But again, what's our defense? Here he says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand an evil day, and having done all to stand. What's the whole armor of God? The whole armor of God for any of God's children is Christ himself. Don't think of any kind of physical armor. Here's where people go wrong and they think, well, we've got to take matters in our own hands and, and fight off. Say, no, take on Christ captain of your salvation. And uh, even as Nehemiah said, when the trumpet sounds, rally, he said the trumpeter was near him. Rally to where he is. And then when you look at what the armor represents here in verses 14 on down, you see every one of these is a representation of Christ. Stand, therefore, how do we stand? We stand in Christ. We stand in his finished work. Accomplished. Having your loins girt about with truth. When it talks about your loins. That's your, the strength of your very core. But what is it that upholds any of God's children? It's the truth. Who's the truth? It's Christ. And having on what? The breastplate of righteousness. What's that? That's Christ. That's his righteousness that he earned and established and God imputed once for all upon his death at the cross. And then your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Our feet are not shod with the preparation of the law or legalism. No, the gospel of peace. In other words, that peace that Christ himself has already established on behalf of his people. And above all, taking the shield of faith What's faith? That's Christ. Wherever you see faith as a noun, it's not taking the shield of your believing. Well, I better crank up my belief. No, take on the shield of faith. Take on the shield of Christ, who is the protector of the souls of his people, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. There's no fiery dart of the wicked could never touch one of God's children because... Christ has already paid their sin debt. He is their peace. And then take the helmet of salvation. What's that? Well, Christ. So from top to bottom, it's Christ, Christ, Christ. And his person is finished work. And the sword of the Spirit. Well, what's the sword of the Spirit? Here it says, which is the Word of God. Who's the Word of God? It's Christ. What is the Spirit's work to do but to direct our hearts to Christ, who is the Word, and therefore praying always with all prayer and supplication, where? In the Spirit. See, the praying always is the result of all who Christ has been made to any one of us. And these are not, the prayers here are not cries of desperation, oh Lord, you got to intervene. No. A prayer here is the heart cry unto the Lord, the supplication that through it all, Lord himself received the glory and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And the word saints there means all the justified ones. All those that have been justified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see that is the ready defense. It's the very armor of Christ himself whereby 
the scriptures say not even the gates of hell can prevail against him. That's a blessed truth. So coming back to our text here in Nehemiah chapter 4 and verses 16 to 23, but beginning, first of all, in verses 16 and 17, what is the defense that we see here? Well, it's the sword and the trowel. Those are both symbolic. As we saw already, the sword representing the word. It's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And these that were building the wall, they were to have that sword in their hand. And then at the same time, the trowel. What's a trowel but a tool, an instrument, was a flat instrument that was used to spread the mortar around as they built the wall. And so here we have a picture, really, of what it is to serve Christ and his church, which is true of any one of us. We're both laborers together with God. That's the picture of the soul of the trowel, the building of his kingdom. Every time you go out and witness of Christ in this world and testify of him, you're laboring in the field. And the Lord is using that witness. That's, that's what he said to his disciples. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. What we know of Christ is not to remain in these four walls. Here we're gathering. This is almost like a rallying. I liken it to when the police show up for their, their shift. They do roll call. And then each one is given their station whereby they go out. Well, consider our meeting times here a roll call. Are you here? Well, why are you here? Because the Lord brought you. Now where are you going to go? You can go right back out there, and you're going to testify of Christ to this world. It's not something that we keep to ourselves, especially if we know what Christ has done for us. Everybody keeps talking about how bad the world is. Well, guess how bad you are? And yet the Lord was pleased to deliver such as you are. So go out there and tell the world. Tell those that instead of criticizing them and looking down your nose at them, tell them of God's grace and mercy, what he did for you. You see, so that's what I consider to be laboring in the field. And it is, it's rough. Different types of soil. And yet where God has purposed to bless that word of Christ, there's nothing that can hinder it. I thank God for the person that began to speak to me, even though I was going down a false path path. I, I was religious. I had a profession. But I didn't know anything about the sovereign God. and didn't know anything about my own sinfulness. And the Lord has used different people to question me along the way. And when I look back now, I thank God he did. Because he was using them so that I would not be left in darkness and blindness to be able to stand here today and preach this gospel for you. So they, I thank God for the laborers. The Lord himself said that. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that what? He send forth laborers into his field. And that's really what's represented here by these, that that was their role, to labor in the building of the wall. But at the same time, we see in Scripture where those that are the Lord's are soldiers, soldiers of the cross. That doesn't mean we go out and take up a sword and fight. I know in history there have been those that have thought that that's the way to do it. Go riding out with a sword and force people to convert with a sword and if not, they perish. There have been religious wars fought back and forth in history that have been brutal but has not done one thing to advance the true work of God as far as salvation is concerned because it's not with the physical sword. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. That's not how we're called upon to fight. But taking up the banner of Christ, we go forth. And just know again that when we go out there to testify, there's going to be a fight. You won't have a fight in this popular message today that's being preached God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life and if you'll just accept him then all will be well that's not there's no fight there people are like oh that sounds pretty good but declare to sinners the sovereign work of God and salvation 
that salvation's in his hands and not yours. And that if any are to be saved, it's only through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that he didn't die for everybody, but he died for those that the Father gave him. You want to start a fight, just make that statement alone. Because people are being told that he died for every single person, and yet the, the one thing that makes the difference is you. Well, if that's the case, then salvation is not a Lord. It's, it's you. You're the ultimate one that determines salvation, but that's not what we find in Scripture. And when we declare this message, it's going to stir up anger and enmity in the heart of sinners because sinners, apart from the Spirit of Christ, they want the glory. They like it when you, they attend places of worship where they're always being built up and told how good a job they're doing. They don't want to go someplace and be told they're a sinner, wretched, undone, and worthy of condemnation. But I'll tell you, that's the message the Lord uses to bring down the, the proud. Lay them low in order that the Lord Jesus Christ himself be lifted up and exalted. But this is a picture that we see here in my text in these, these scripture verses, 13 through 16, of the labor that some actually bore the spears and the shields. They were divided up and the bows and the harbingers, and then others were actually laboring and spreading mortar on the wall. And I liken this to how it is the Lord has distributed the work of his church. It's not everybody that goes out there on the forefront, such as evangelists, or even as the Lord purposed that I be raised up and go out to Africa and preach out there for a while while others labored back here in the United States, supporting me as I went out and, and preached Christ in, in the, the regions beyond. You know, I thank God for those that he had standing behind me, not only in prayer, but support. And that's the way it is today, even now. It's not everybody that is called to stand and preach as I'm doing right now. And my voice going out and, and people hearing this voice and if there's a tax that come, it comes to the preacher. But here you are as laborers together, I trust, in uh, upholding me in your prayers and encouraging me with your words and even yourselves as the Lord directs, taking this word and going out there and speaking to others. You have people that you can speak to that I never will. I'll never meet. But that's what it is to, as you're going in the world to preach the gospel, talk to those in your workplace and people you meet along the way. I love to hear those testimonies. You know, we often come in at the end of the day and think, well, that was a rough work day. Well, when you started the day, were, were you asking the Lord to give you eyes for any, perhaps, any sheep? that you might encounter. And don't think that if it's a sheep that's gonna be necessarily somebody that's all ready to hear. We weren't that way when we first began, but the Lord tendered us. As we heard of Christ, our heart was tendered, and then it became evident as we were drawn to Christ that we were one of those sheep. Think of Saul of Tarsus, breathing out <laughs> anger, toward any that claimed to be a Christian. He wasn't in any way seeking Christ, and yet he was the Lord's all along. And in the Lord's time, he brought him down. So speak of Christ and uh, be bold about it as the Lord gives opportunity. I don't mean to beat people over the head with it, but labor and uh, be that spokesman for Christ as he, as he directs the word. And he'll cause his people to hear. But the second, and that's that's the defense here. We're not cowering in face of persecution and opposition or those that stand against us, but we labor as God gives us the grace and strength. But the second defense that I wanted to see here is the clear trumpet sound. I love this. This is a message in and of itself. 
In verse 18, for the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side, and so built. Does that not describe any one of us that have the sword by our side, that is the word of God, the very spirit of Christ, the sword being the, the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word. But then it says here, Nehemiah speaking, and he that sounded the trumpet was by me. So here was a, a person or persons that their one task was in the face of whatever danger it was that they faced, that they would sound the trumpet and sound it clearly and sound it plainly. What's that trumpet sound, again, other than the gospel? The best defense against the errors of this world in false religion is somebody sounding the trumpet and declaring Christ. I've had different occasions over the years. People hear I'm a preacher and they'll invite me to the one of the little Bible studies or they'll invite me to a meeting. I've had that even here in Shreveport over the years, different times. And they invite me expecting to hear maybe something they've heard all along and all of a sudden it's an opportunity to clearly set forth Christ for them and you can see the deer in the headlight look like We've never heard this before. Well, that's the clear trumpet sound. And so necessary. You know, there are many instruments of music that are mentioned in the Bible. But the trumpet stands above them all. I know there are some that want to try to attract people with pleasant musical instruments, so to speak. Try to soften up the message of the word and make it palatable to people. And hopefully then they'll eventually come to believe, but that's not the way the Lord's declared it to be done. Here is the sound of the trumpet. In fact, if you look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verses 7 and 8, you see the Corinthian church was getting distracted by all kinds of different side issues, diversity of gifts, that became their thing, and uh, some were talking about having gifts of wisdom and some of administration. It was just all one member lifting themselves above another. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, in verses 7 and 8, Paul, when he says in verse 6, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, you see, here the context of tongues, don't think of some gibberish. As the Lord was bringing in Gentiles into the congregation, with them came those languages in which they spoke. And sooner, sooner or later, the ones with the most of that particular language group or whatever began to dominate in the congregation. And so there was division. I faced this in Africa in one little congregation where I was ministering, we had nine different languages spoken. You talk about difficulty in preaching. I was thankful that I was able to communicate in French, but there were times where I had two people translating for me, so I had to say a word and wait for this one to translate and then that one to translate, and then while that was going on, another one was, had gathered around them in the back of the meeting room those of that language and, and that person was simultaneously translating what I was saying. It's difficult. And so this is what Paul's talking about. He says, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit to you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? It doesn't matter what language, that's what the word tongues here is. It doesn't matter how eloquent you may speak. But if I'm not speaking by revelation, in other words, by the Spirit taking the word of Christ and revealing it, or by knowledge that the Lord gives, or by prophesying, that means through preaching, or by doctrine, the doc all these are essential for the hearing of the gospel. It's not just speaking in a language you hear preachers speaking in English, and you understand clearly the language, but 
There's no revelation of Christ. There's no doctrine of Christ. The person's just speaking based upon what they learned while they were in preacher school. What does that profit? This is what Paul's saying here. He says, and even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds. How shall it be known what is piped or harped? And here it is. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound. There's an uncertain sound of the trumpet today. People taking up this word, but they're not preaching God's glory. They're not preaching salvation being of the Lord. They're preaching a mixed message of here's what God would like, but here's what man must do. They're elevating man into the place of God. But if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to a battle? How is it that if a man stand and preach but does not declare Christ in all his clarity, that sinners will hear and know to whom they are to come, just like back here in Nehemiah. The one sounding the trumpet was to stand by him. There weren't different sounds going out. It was clear when this trumpet sounded, that was the rally call to him, Nehemiah, just like the preaching of the gospel. The rally call is to Christ and to none other. We're not here to see how many baptisms we can get. That's not the message. We're not to see how big we can build the membership. No, not to see how much money we can bring in. All these things are an uncertain sound today but to declare Christ and so he says here verse 9 so likewise you accept ye utter by the tongue in other words by the language words easy to be understood I do this every week on Friday and Sunday when I'm preaching for those in Malawi it's a different language and I'm mindful that what I have to say and to preach to them, those that don't understand the English, because there are many that don't understand the English language over there, it's all the local Chichua is the language, that the only person they're really hearing is the interpreter. They're not hearing my word. So I have to preach in such a manner, a clear sound, that that interpreter takes that very word and then preaches it. That's the sound of the trumpet. And I'm thankful the Lord has given us some men over there because if they don't understand what I've just said, they'll ask me to repeat it. I love the way they put it. They say, reverse the statement, dear brother. And I don't know if you've ever been trying to preach through a, I call them interrupters, but they are interpreters that you're already on to the next thought when suddenly now you've got to go back and think, okay, what was it that I just said? Well, I believe that's the sense here. We're not to be trying to be eloquent with people and impress them with how much we know. No, it says, except ye utter by the tongue or language words easy to be understood. The problem, even with people with regard to the gospel and Christ and his finished work, isn't because it's difficult. You can state it as simply and plainly, none are saved except by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and all for whom he shed the blood are saved, there's none in hell for whom he died. That's simple language, but it takes the Spirit of God. To, it's, the problem isn't understanding, it's believing it. Therein is the, the issue. But nonetheless, we use words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. And I wonder sometimes how many of those words are just in the air. Because we're trying, we're trying to bring it home. And it's not us, it's, it's the Lord. He says there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. So therefore, Paul determined to speak in a language that they could understand. That's the sound of the trumpet. Coming back here to wrap it up here in Nehemiah 4. Those are the two defenses that we see here. One is the, the sword and the trowel, and the other is the trumpet. These are all symbolic of the sound of the gospel. And uh, but here's the, the part I'll close with in verse 20. In what place 
Therefore ye hear the sound of the trumpet. Interpret that in the sense of the gospel. In what place ye hear the sound of Christ, clearly set forth distinctly, resort ye thither unto us. That's where the message is. It's to Christ. That was John the Baptist, behold the Lamb. And I love this part. Our God shall fight for us. Whose is the work to do? It's none other than God himself. A lot more could be said there, but I pray that uh, what we've heard is blessed of the Lord. All right, let's stop there for now. Pick up from there next time. Let's take our hymn books and turn to one final hymn before we're dismissed. Hymn number 36, a great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Hymn number 36, and that will be dismissed. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood, a mortal hills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, a man of God's own choosing. Thus ask who that may be, Christ Jesus it is he, Lord Son